noticed how much the new paradigm looks like the old paradigm. Um, I think if you actually started including buzzwords in the consumer price index, we'd have Zimbabwe levels of inflation. Um, real paradigm shifts involve changing basic assumptions about how the world works. They change not just what we believe we know, but what we know we know. And I'm going to be talking about a real paradigm shift that's going on in the social sciences, and especially economics, about how we think about human nature. And I want to talk about what that means for the rest of us, including the people up on the Hill in Parliament House. But before I do that, I want to tell you a story about how we learned about light. So it's the 1600s, and Isaac Newton gets very, very excited about the idea of light as a particle. There was a competing theory around the, at the time. A guy called Huygens thought that light was a wave, but Huygens was not the um, rather tetchy and very famous president of the Royal Society. So for the next 100 years, we agreed with Newton, and we knew that light was made of particles. 1800s, and Thomas Young comes up with the rather pro provocatively named double slit experiment. Light passes through two gaps in a barrier, and then when the light hits another barrier on the other side, it makes patterns that look very much as though waves are interfering with each other. So we thought, aha, that Newton, smart guy, but a bit old hat. Uh, you know, light's definitely a wave. Then Einstein comes along, gets us back onto particles again with his whole photon theory. We learn how to slow down the Thomas Young experiment so that we release only one photon at a time. Uh, when a photon hits the other side, there's a photon hitting the other side. This is actually, oh, it's back to front. This is actually a, um, a picture of photons hitting the other side in this experiment over time. So there's just a few to start with, then there's more. Only one photon at a time, but over time, you see those patterns there, those waves. The same wave pattern emerges. And this is the weird thing, because there's only one. So how can waves be interfering with each other? It's actually as if the light, one single particle, is interfering with itself. It's kind of trippy. Um, so, you know, we then actually realise that the answer to this question, is light a particle or a wave, is yes it is. <laughs> and actually so is the rest of matter, and you know, the weird wave particle thingies are made up of other weird wave particle thingies, and it's just, you know, mind-blowing weirdness in the universe all the way down, and people like Fritjof Capra get to go away and write the Tao of Physics and talk about how he's found Krishna and he was behind the quarks the whole time. Um, and the really interesting thing is that we find out that whether light looks more like a particle or a wave depends on what we're looking for. So these weird wave particle thingies, we actually have to interact with them in order to observe them. So what we expect influences what we see. And I think that debates about human nature are a lot like this. So what's the answer to this question? Yes, we are. We are a complex bundle of dreams and instincts that compete with and complement each other. Whether we act more like Mother Teresa or Bernie Madoff today depends on millions of years of evolution, decades of family history, and whether or not you got right to the end of the coffee queue this morning and then the bell rang to come inside and you missed out. Uh, someone actually donated their coffee to me this morning. That is altruism. <laughs> so human nature. Complex. Humans trying to organise themselves in groups. Really, really complex. It's, it's a pretty simple idea, but we're still arguing about whether humans basically are particles or waves. Are we autonomous individuals making rational decisions to maximise our own self-interest? Or are we connected, caring, sharing types who feel each other's pain as our own? And the answer depends very much on what we're looking for. So, imagine you're sending a whole bunch of students into an economics course, and they spend a whole lot of time learning about how humans maximise their self-interest. What effect do you think that that will have on their personality? Has anybody got a guess? I want to guess here. How, how have they changed at the end of the economics course compared to the start of it? Greedier. Greedier. 
So there, there is actually a, a bunch of studies. So, so economists do actually exhibit more self-interested behaviour than the general population. But the interesting thing is there's a study that actually looks at how they are when they go into the course and how they are when they come out of the course. And yes, they are more selfish. So how we learn affects how we behave, what we think we know about ourselves. Um, on the other hand, if we think that everyone else is being really good to each other, we're more likely to do the same. So uh, there's one study of signage uh, that's just trying to discourage people to steal in a park in Arizona. And uh, they, they found that signage that talks about what a big problem stealing is increases stealing. <laughs> and signage that talks about how theft is really rare and highly disproved of decreases stealing. Um, I think we're actually getting closer to an Einstein moment in how we think about human nature. We've been through a phase in which the economics of self-interest was very dominant. Our butchers and bakers might be bastards, but that doesn't really matter as long as they're willing to swap bread for dough. Uh, greed is good, society non-existent. Everywhere we looked, we looked for selfish behaviour, and we found a whole global financial crisis full of it. So we are now at a point where we're rediscovering the caring, sharing side of ourselves. Are we competitive or cooperative? Yep. Angry guy up there, that's a chimpanzee. Uh, the uh, love-in down here, they're bonobos. Uh, both of them share 98% of their DNA with humans. Each species has quite a different way of dealing with conflict. Uh, in chimpanzee land, uh, there's a real status hierarchy. The big chimpanzees lorded over the littler chimpanzees, and that's how they deal with resource conflicts. Uh, the bonobos' way of dealing with conflict is being nice to each other. Uh, through acts like reciprocal grooming, you know, I'll eat your nits, you eat mine. Um, and actually, if you know or have heard anything about bonobos, you might know that they also deal with it by being very, very nice to each other. <laughs> and today's society has a lot in common with the collective cooperative bonobos uh, and with the competitive and, uh, and uh, individualistic chimpanzees. Um, I'm not actually old enough to remember the 60s, but I suspect that it particularly had a lot in common with bonobos back then. Um, so one trait, though, this is an interesting thing that happened, one trait can become dominant. So, for example, in response to a sudden rise or drop in resources. And then that trait can reinforce itself. So one example of how this can happen uh, is when we decide to tolerate more inequality as a society which means tolerating more health problems, more violence, more mental illness, and also less trust, which therefore means less willingness to cooperate to bring down inequality. Another way that this happens is through culture. So you show students from Japan and the United States a, uh, a lovely aquatic underwater scene. There's a big fish, there's some smaller fish, kind of general aquatic life. Um, and if you then take the scene away and you ask Japanese students to describe what they remember of it, they'll start by setting the scene. You know, there was a lake, the, uh, the bottom was rocky, the water was green. Um, and can anybody guess what the Americans remember? Big fish, small fish, aquatic life. Big fish, you got it. Yeah. Um, and actually, uh, the... Japanese students are 70% more likely to describe not only the background detail, um, but they're actually twice as likely also to describe the relationships between different objects in the scene. It's kind of interesting. Uh, just thinking about what um, Julia was saying about Australian culture earlier, I really wonder where we would sit um, on that spectrum. So we've all heard about the tragedy of the commons. You know, if it's rational to free ride, we will free ride, even if groups of free riders will actually be worse off than groups of cooperators. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize last year for her work looking at why so many commons don't actually end in tragedy. 
And her research showed that sometimes, when you put a bunch of people together with a scarce resource, they work out ways of using it wisely and making it last. Crazy notion. You know, somebody should tell the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is kind of, you know, kindergarten, play school, uh, you know, um, Sesame Street stuff, cooperation. Um, so, if self-interest is our main, our dominant human trait, then there should be a direct relationship between pay and performance. The more we're paid, the better we should perform and behave. Again, the observations in the real world don't actually back this up. And in fact, the rewards for some kinds of behaviour, like things that we would want to do for fun, or things that we'd want to do for a good cause, actually decrease our motivation to do them. The more we're rewarded, the less we feel motivated. Uh, who in the audience has ever donated blood? Can you stick your hand up? Nice work. Um, now, keep your hand up if you were paid for it. Anyone? Anyone ever been paid for blood? Um, so, put your hand up if you were more likely to donate blood if you were paid for it. So, you know, that's very irrational, that's not particularly self-interested. Well, economists, you know, uh, something to be studied there. So, so, that actually has been studied. Um, and we find that the more that we pay for blood, the worse its quality is. Australia actually has an entirely unpaid blood system and it's one of the safest in the world. And many donors say that they would actually be less likely to donate if they were paid. Um, but that's donating, so we all know that we do that out of the goodness of our own hearts, right? What about paying for performance at work? Most of us don't work for free, after all. Um, there's got to be some monetary motivation there. Well, yes, but it's a bit complex. So experiments find that um, there are some of these same traits in the workplace. Big fat rewards for performance can actually decrease performance. And for knowledge work, uh, which, you know, let's face it, is kind of an increasing proportion of the work that we're doing now, very high rewards can be very damaging to your performance. Now, does this make sense? What does that mean? That was the only picture I could find of a stock market, I think it was from the 80s. Um, <laughs> Governments and markets, it means some really interesting things, I think, for how we think about governments and markets. They're tools, they're social tools. We use them to solve problems that we can't solve by ourselves or in small groups. Markets draw more on self-interest than common interest, which makes them really good tools for solving profitable problems and increasing private wealth. Governments and civil society draw more on common interest and self-interest, which makes them great tools for building public goods and building commonwealth. Um, interesting thing, so public servants will work for lower pay because, you know, uh, than they will often get in the private sector. And it's probably partly because they're actually motivated to serve. So there's a doing good premium on their salary. So what does this mean for government if we have this idea that humans are only motivated by self-interest and we start working that into our work practices? If we start treating public servants like peace workers instead of knowledge workers, we could actually crowd out that intrinsic motivation. It's kind of the, the same in effect as giving them a pay cut. Um, I think that whichever sector we spend time in, we take our human nature with us. We don't stop being competitive in the NGO sector. And anybody who's actually worked in the NGO sector will know what I mean. Um, we don't stop caring about fairness when we exchange things with each other. We don't stop being fully human just because we clock on or go shopping. So I think that GFCs happen when we turn markets into systems for rewarding greed and governments aren't there to kind of take the cookie jar away and put it on the top shelf. Um, but we shouldn't actually have to think about markets that way. Everyone deserves to come home from work at the end of the day feeling like they've made the world a better place. So this is where I get all kind of Capra Daoist and stuff on you. Um, 
uh, as, as someone who works for a progressive think tank, I'm really supposed to pick a side. Um, and, you know, sometimes that happens. So I actually went along to um, a Mont Pelerin Society event uh, last week. Um, which is an international organisation of um, conservative think tanks. And they were talking about the future of think tanks and they had a panel. And there was a guy there from a UK um, quite right-wing think tank and he said, big win, we've just had a really big win. They've cut the child benefit. <laughs> and, um, and so there are times when I do pick a side. Um, <laughs> but I would say that that kind of neoliberal attitude to the world. It's not bad because it has a role for self-interest, but because it leaves very little room for anything else. Communism, I think, was actually suffering from being skewed in the opposite direction. So no society is entirely free of one thing or the other, and neither is any individual. Um, somebody actually asked me to um, you know, use a different example than Mother Teresa as the kind of postal, poster girl for altruism, because apparently she was a bit of an arrogant tosser. I think that's kind of the point. <laughs> At some points in history, progress depends on different traits in human nature. Sometimes we need to give more weight to individual desires. So there was a time when feminists basically needed to say, enough of all this self-sacrifice, you know, we want to be self-serving individualists like blokes. Um, there was a time when activists in East Germany needed to shift the focus away from the collective and towards the individual. So a mix of traits have helped us deal over time with the world as it was. I think we now need to ask ourselves, what traits now will help us flourish in the world as it is? We unconsciously remake ourselves in the image of our own stereotypes all the time. So what happens if we actually become aware of that process? If we look at problems like climate change and back at ourselves and change our expectations? <laughs>